the world most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, television journal of the important issues of the hour. Brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and contributing editor for Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Charles Francis Parker, one of America's great philosophers, liberal leader, and author of note. The opinions discussed are necessarily those of the speakers. Dr. Potter, here at the beginning of the new year, I'm sure that our Chronoscope audience would like the views of a great liberal preacher. And you are a preacher, are you not, sir? And perhaps a Yankee preacher? They call me the preacher, yes. Yeah. And you've just published an autobiography called The Preacher and I. Right. And you've always regarded yourself. You've been a, you've been a lifelong liberal, I believe. Right. And does that mean, sir, that you uh, supported new and fair deals, Truman and Roosevelt? Yes, sir. You voted for Roosevelt throughout his career, and you voted for Truman in 48. I did. Well, I'm sure that uh, our audience would like some advice from you, or like your views tonight, sir, on the very grave problems of 1952. Now, what do you think is the principal problem facing the American people in 1952, sir? The problem of morality is the leading problem, it seems to me. How we can achieve a higher and better morality. As a preacher, you are concerned, or as a philosopher, you are concerned about uh, what you think is a drift away from moral standards. Yes. Well, are you talking, Dr. Potter, about the morality of the American people as a whole or the morality of the political level of the country or what? What do you have primarily in mind? Morality and government. That seems to me the, the place where it seems to be breaking down now. You've noted, you you've noted yourself a general deterioration in, 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 in government morality. I've noticed it deteriorating, but I have also noticed that we're waking up to the fact that it is deteriorating. Well, what strikes you as outstanding in this? What are the chief symptoms of this breakdown in morality? Well, lack of responsibility uh, in the part of men in, uh, that are high in office, that have responsible positions, and even those that are halfway down. It seems to be running like a cancer through the whole system, the whole setup. You expect to vote against the present administration in 1952, sir? I certainly do. And primarily because of what you think is this moral breakdown? I do. And uh, would you say that the tax scandals uh, have impressed you most uh, as, as, being, as being most significant in this breakdown? I think that the exposure of the uh, scandals in the income tax department particularly are revealing what's happening in the whole system. Do you think well, that, that you, Pardon me, uh, Bill, I just wanted to ask this. What do you think are the main reasons for that, uh, Dr. Potter? Is it a matter of the political setup, or is it a matter of a declining sense of morality in the American public? Well, I think that capable, honest men have stayed out of politics when they should have been in it. And I think they're as much to blame as the crooks that are in. Well, don't you think that in some respects it's the uh, uh, immense uh, oversize that government has come to that's caused a lot of this and the uh, immense uh, interference of government in the affairs of the public. For example, take something like the RFC. Now here is an institution, it's a public bank, a government bank, uh, set up for the purpose of making loans to firms that can't get loans from private institutions. Yes. Now, when you have such an institution, and it can make loans of up to $100 million or whatnot to an individual firm, doesn't this in itself create a situation that has uh, great temptations Natural. for bribery and yes, corruption? it does. 
And you think then that the reducing of the uh, general un over unwieldiness of government would help to some extent to reduce the dimensions of the evil? I think it would reduce the temptation somewhat, but I don't think that's the only trouble. Well, what do these temptations go back to as you see it? Well, it wouldn't tempt a man <coughs> unless he was vulnerable, and he's vulnerable if he doesn't have his conscience in pretty good working order. And his conscience is not in good working order because of the public conscience uh, being in less good working order or because of lack of his personal accountability? Well, they work together. They play together. The individual says, well, everybody's doing it. Uh, I might as well get my share, my part. And that is uh, uh, a cancerous thing in our body politic, it uh, seems to me. Dr. Potter, I'm sure that here at the beginning of 1952, the American people want to do some soul searching and see where their responsibility lies. Now, this uh, corruption in government is a symptom, isn't it? I mean, it's a symptom of something that's wrong with our whole people. Yes. It's, uh, the measles are breaking out, and uh, that's good, because now we know what the trouble is and we can cure it. I have ultimate faith in the American people. We'll, this is only a, a temporary thing, and it's only a surface thing. Well, now, now I mean, when the, the American people are all right. When the American people know the facts, you feel that they will yeah. themselves make the correction. The only <laughs> danger is keeping the facts from the people. Well, now, where would you go back and place uh, the blame for this symptom that's now obvious? Would you say that uh, a breakdown in the home has had something to do with it? Yes, definitely. You can trace it right back to the home because when you begin to blame the school, the school teachers say they haven't cooperation from the home, that when the children get to them, they haven't uh, any sense of moral responsibility. They destroy property in the school, even. Do you think there's been some failure on the part of the church? Well, I think the church has its uh, share of the blame. I you think the do. family, the school, and the church uh, all uh, must share the blame for some of this moral deterioration? They have to get together. You, well, you don't think that they have been teaching perhaps enough individual responsibility? They, they have failed in that regard. Do you think that the school should give direct moral instruction, or do you think that ought to be left to the parents and to the church? I think the school should uh, have morality and ethics shot through the entire program. I don't think you can isolate them from life. The whole life must be moral. And uh, when they don't get the uh, cooperation of the home, then's when the trouble begins. They start, what do they start with? They teach a child, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep if I should die. And then they expect the child to have social responsibility when they focused it upon his own welfare, his own well, salvation. Don't you think that helps to give him some individual responsibility? Well, to a certain extent, but the child himself knows. He counteracts that by saying, well, God bless Papa, God bless Mama, God bless Aunt Jane. He's got a social sense there that uh, the prayer omits. Now, Dr. <coughs> Potter, I'm sure that our audience would appreciate some specific recommendations from you here at the beginning of the year. Now, first of all, what do you think an American can do about this deteriorating situation? Well, I think one of the first things to do is to uh, excite even more the public indignation, create a more responsive uh, public opinion, you and uh, throw, not only throw the rascals out, but uh, get the idea into the people that they are themselves responsible, that they ought to go to the polls and vote and vote intelligently. Well, do you think it brings a certain public apathy among the people that they, that they can't get at uh, an administration except once every four years, on one specific day every four years? Well, I think there and should be a recall provision that would take care of that between times. Why wait four years in these very busy times when a whole, a whole crisis can develop within a, a week? Well, you would you be in favor of something like the British system in which a vote of confidence can change an administration uh, overnight or a lack of vote of confidence? Well, I wouldn't have felt that way once, but I certainly do now. Mm -hmm. You think that the first thing for the American people to do then is to get mad, to uh, have a, to demonstrate a capacity for moral indignation? I'd like to see a wave of righteous indignation sweep this country. But you would agree, I believe, that just throwing the rascals out 
is not enough. No, I mean, that's uh, not you, enough. since it is just a symptom, why the people themselves are going to have to produce a more responsible brand of leadership. We've got to educate our young men to appreciate public service in public office as an honor and a responsibility. Well, not something to be dodged. <coughs> Dr. Potter, I'd li like to ask you what your standards would be on some of these things. For example, uh, do you think a public official ought to accept gifts from anybody that he's in a position to give favors to? Do you think no. he ought to accept any gifts at all, or, or where should he draw the line? I think a person in a public position should not accept gifts. Throughout my ministry, for instance, I've refused to accept a 10% discount to the clergy and a half fare on the railroads because I think that's creating a moral situation which is dangerous. And I think, therefore, that anyone in a public position should be very, very careful about accepting any gifts of any kind from anybody. Well, as a final question, uh, Dr. Potter, uh, how would you summarize your advice to the American people in 1952 as to what they can do about this situation? Well, I'd say, first of all, Educate yourself on public affairs. Second, be sure to vote. And third, be sure your own house is in order. And uh, when the voting time comes, be there and ready to elect somebody who will be responsible. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Charles Francis Potter, noted philosopher and author. <coughs> Each year, some 800,000 people witness the bowl game, the traditional championship playoffs between college football teams, which take place on New Year's Day. And countless other millions follow these games on television and on radio. Now each year, for many years past, all of the major bowl games are timed by Longines, the world's most honored watch in sports as in other fields of precise timing. The reason for the choice of Longines watches for the official timing of championship sports events is the greater accuracy which is inbuilt into every Longines watch by correct engineering, the finest manufacturing, and most important, the precious hand finishing of essential parts that distinguishes every Longines watch. The skills gained in producing high-precision watches for scientific purposes has contributed to the betterment of all Longines watches. For excellence and elegance, Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards. For accuracy, Longines watches have won prize after prize from the leading government observatories of the world. And yet, you may buy and proudly own a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866. Maker of watches of the highest character. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. This is Frank Knight again reminding you that the Longines Chronoscope is brought to you three times weekly, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So won't you join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.
this is the CBS Television Network.